Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Film Fan Club Show. This is the first episode of our 2024 season, so Happy New Year. Yes, for you Marvel fans, we've finally caught up to the five-year time jump in Avengers Endgame, and we're now in living through the real-life version of Phase 4. So if this year sucks, now you know why. Uh, a lot of stories broke while we were off. Uh, Barbenheimer happened just a week after Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 came out. I, I think that's a big reason why Dead Reckoning 1 flopped at the box office. Yeah, that movie did so bad they delayed the sequel by a year and they dropped Dead Reckoning Part 2 from that movie's title. So now there's a movie called Dead Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, but no Part 2. I mean, at this point they should just call the movie Mission Impossible, oh screw it. Yeah, that's not the only movie that got pushed back. The strikes caused a lot of delays. Fro Ghostbusters Frozen Empire was pushed back from 2023 into the March 2024 date, formerly held by Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse. And Beyond the Spider-Verse now has no release date. So it could just pop up at any moment, you know, like some in-law. And, and in a surprise move, Sony has retitled it Spider-Man's Dead Reckoning Part 2. Yeah. Uh, a lot of changes come into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, have you guys heard about this? Uh, Michael Waldron is reported to be writing Avengers 5, which was going to be called the Kang Dynasty before Kang actor Jonathan Majors was dropped by Disney. So I guess that was a pretty short dynasty. Uh, it's a real blow to the movie, too. I mean, Michael Waldron writing the script? Ugh. Uh, speaking of Marvel, you know, you, we're going to talk about the show Echo on the show today. Echo spends a lot of time setting up the, the next Daredevil series, Daredevil Born Again. You know, the character... Daredevil shows up and fights uh, Echo, Kingpin is the main villain, but apparently the new Daredevil show was a huge mess behind the scenes. Have you guys, I don't know if you guys have seen the reports, but in the reports, Daredevil didn't even show up in costume in his own show, mind you, until episode four. I mean, come on. If I wanted to see a normal person who was blind and, didn't, and couldn't appreciate what was right in front of him, I'd just talk to my ex-girlfriend. Uh, one box office success last year was uh, the A the Taylor Swift Eras Tours movie. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but you know I, I saw the real thing uh, in real life. But uh, you know, the movie did really well, thank God. After the financial failure of Dead Reckoning Part One of One, it was nice to see the good guys win. Uh, what's even cooler is how she released it. Taylor Swift bypassed the major studios and distributed the film directly to AMC theaters and Cinemark. You know she's a real movie theater fan. I love this about her. The studios, though, they did not like this. You know how in Super Mario 64, every time you defeat Bowser, he levels up, you know? I think that's what the uh, studios are doing now, because Warner Brothers Discovery and Paramount Pictures, are have, they have been having meetings about a potential merger to combine the studios. They want to join together and create a super studio. Yeah, so then maybe they can take on Taylor Swift and give us that Transformers Justice League crossover we've always wanted. Okay, we've got a great show for you tonight. Like I said, we're going to be talking about the new Echo Marvel series, so get ready for that. Let's get right to our discussion. All right, let's welcome tonight's guest. He is the pop culture writer for the Tulsa World, based here in northeastern Oklahoma. Jimmy Trammell is with us. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to have you back. It's, I'm, I'm losing count of how many times you've been on the show, but you're starting to become a regular guest here. It's nice to I see think you. so, yeah. Uh, so we're talking about Echo today, but uh, kind of before we start about Echo, I was telling you before we start recording, it's been a big year for uh, 2023 was a big year for Native American representation in media, whether it be Reservation Dogs wrapping up its third and final season, Killers of the Flower Moon being released, and now, you know, all sorts of Oscars buzz around that. And then now at the beginning of 2024, Echo came out. Uh, just uh, you just kind of covering all this here in northeastern Oklahoma. What what do you have to say about just how, you know, the, the year in review kind of? Yeah, just, just a fantastic year for natives in film. You know, us, you know, given the fact that Flower Moon is a very sad movie and it was based on uh, a real life tragedy. I don't want to, you know, gloss over that. So it's not like that part is glorious. But as far as native representation on film, it's just unprecedented because Flower Moon worked with the Osage every step of the way to make sure uh, their voices were heard and the language was used and the uh, wardrobe was correct. And then, you know, as you said, Reservation Dogs, uh, the third season wrapped up on its own terms, which when 
does a series ever get to go out on its own terms? But I, I think, you know, just unanimously beloved by Oklahoma, just the most Oklahoma show ever, Reservation Dogs, because you watch it and say, oh, I know that guy, that guy, that guy, that girl. And then, uh, you know, concluding, as you said, uh, here we are with Echo, the Marvel, Marvel comes to Oklahoma. Who would have ever expected, aside from Broxton and, and Thor, yeah. and a mention of Salina in the Loki series. But this is a show set in Oklahoma. And until, I think, maybe October, November, I don't think anybody had any idea that it was associated with the Choctaws in Oklahoma. Yeah, I thought that was a really nice surprise. I'm still a little mixed on it because Reservation Dogs and Killers of the Flower Moon, of course, shot here. And I believe Echo shot in, in Georgia or something like that. Is that. Am I right? Do you know about that? That's right. Although you do you do see the casino, Choctaw Casino, in the background of episode one in the closing credits. And there is a scene, I think it's in episode four of Echo, where it does take place. It appears to have been shot at the casino. Whether it was or not, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and so Echo's out now and they made it, they did make a big push behind the scenes. They may not have shot everything here in Oklahoma, but behind the scenes, they uh, worked with the Choctaw tribe. And I believe the finale has a, has a card in the credits that says special thank you to the Choctaw nation for their collaboration on this series. A lot of local actors that I know that worked on Killers of the Flower Moon and mm -hmm. Reservation Dogs also pop up in Echo and just seeing their faces uh, you know, or seeing their reactions uh, to seeing their faces on a Disney Plus series. That's, it's very special for me to, to, to just for them to have that experience and be like, oh, I know that person, that person works so hard. And now that here they are in a big show like that. So I think that's amazing. Uh, and part of the, but you know, it, it's, it echoes a little bit of a mixed bag. I think I do think the quality of the product is, is not quite up there with uh, Reservation Dogs and Killers of the Flower Moon. I do wish they would have shot more in Oklahoma, but I do I do appreciate still the strides that they made to kind of connect with the community here. Uh, I was just gonna uh, we were just talking again before we started rolling. They had a a local premiere as well for the first two episodes. I think you said it was in Durant, and uh, you got to attend that. Kind of, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, and and I should say that the same uh, relationship the Osage enjoyed with the Killers of the Flower Moon people, the Choctaws enjoyed that a very similar relationship with Echo in that the Choctaws were consulted every step of the way and the, you see authentic, uh, you know, Choctaw language and culture on the screen. And that was a priority from day one to make sure that this was not a drive-by, like we're gonna use your culture and not tell you. They wanted to incorporate the Choctaws. And part of that is the event you're, you're talking about is a uh, prior, a couple months prior to the premiere they had a red carpet uh, premiere event in Durant. And there was a uh, red carpet press conference kind of situation at the Choctaw Cultural Center, which is right across uh, the highway from the casino. And then that night they had, they showed the first two episodes uh, at the casino, which has a very nice theater inside the casino. I had no idea. Uh, I'm still working off the calories from that event <laughs> because it was like unlimited m ms popcorn, Coke. And, you know, so I'm still hurting from uh, going there and eating all that stuff and watching the premiere, but uh, really just uh, pleased that the Echo people incorporated the Choctaw people every step of the way. One thing I didn't get answered is I asked on the red carpet, like of all the tribes in North America, all the tribes in the world, why the Choctaws? Mm -hmm. uh, why, I mean, I know they didn't pick the name out of a hat, but uh, the people there couldn't answer for me at that time. But that's what I'd be curious to know still of all the tribes, why Choctaw? That is interesting. I, I guess I, I, whenever being here in Oklahoma, and I kind of assume that the world revolves around me. So I was like, I guess, you know, if they're going to go for a Native American tribe, that makes sense. But then that you're like you say, there's a lot of Native American tribes across you know, America, North America. Uh, so they could have, they could have picked any. So I guess it's a little bit more special that they chose the Choctaw. And then like, there's a moment in, in the series kind of jumping ahead a little bit where Kingpin is says, if you need me, I'll be at the Choctaw Casino. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I know where that is. So that's, <laughs> it's very cool. Very cool representation. Um, <clears throat> is there anything else that you wanted to men mention about the event? Were there any big, uh, big names at the event or, or that you got to, got to ask questions? It was, uh, well, the, 
a producer and director, Sydney Freeland, was there. Okay. She was the big name, and she'd worked on uh, Reservation Dogs as well, directed an episode of Reservation Dogs. So she was the main spokesperson at that event. Very cool. Were, were there any other questions that you did get uh, to ask and got answered? Yeah, it's been a while. I forget uh, exactly what I might have asked, but more so it was just about that relation, working relationship between the Choctaw and between uh, Echo. And come to find out, uh, Sydney Freeland, uh, if I would known this, I would have asked her about it on the red carpet. But uh, when she did her kind of intro or post Q&A at the premiere event, the movie theater, she said, you know, she grew up reading Marvel comics on the on the res in uh, I think uh, Arizona or New Mexico, where she was from. So I would have liked to have asked her, you know, what books she was reading at that time. To that would have been her introduction to Marvel comics. Uh, you know, aside from that, the first indigenous character in Marvel comics was set in Oklahoma. Uh, Wyatt Wingfoot was a friend of the Human Torch who lived on a reservation in Oklahoma uh, back in the '60s. Uh, and Stanley, you give him, you can give him a lot of credit for uh, not just by including many ethnic groups. I mean, uh, Marvel obviously expanded and had uh, native characters, uh, Luke Cage, hero for hire, you know, an African-American uh, yeah. superhero at the dawn of the 1970s. So uh, uh, Stan Lee was very much uh, anti-bigot, if that's the best way to to put it. Uh, and, and so like we, you said, you got to see the first two episodes at the premiere before mm -hmm. they even came out on Disney+. Plus. And one thing I saw uh, on your Twitter is that you uh, you said that it was a, a smaller show. Some people have said that Marvel got too big and got too convoluted. And one thing that I think in a reply that you posted that Echo goes yeah. a little bit smaller and goes kind of, uh, I don't want to say low stakes, but you know the world's not on fire and there's not a multiverse ending in this. Do you think that that was a, a, a step in the right direction for Marvel? Well, uh, one thing this is, is it's the first series under the marvel spotlight banner yeah which focuses on kind of individual characters as opposed to these giant epics and for those who know uh, comic book history marvel spotlight was a title that marvel used as a tryout for characters uh it wasn't superman every month it was here's uh ghost rider here's damon hellstrom here is uh spider woman and the characters who were popular enough and these little tryout runs of Marvel Spotlight were rewarded with their own series. Uh, so so that's kind of what Echo is taking from is, uh, you know, we're just going to see not what sticks, but here's a here's a tryout to see you can tell your own story and not be part of this sprawling epic. I, I did think I, I needed Marvel. I needed a Marvel series that was grounded because at this point, uh, everything's a multiverse. Even the you know the Flash uh, DC movie was a multiverse story. This you know the Spider Man and Doctor Strange were multiverse stories, and and you know time travel and yeah. space travel and everything else. I was ready for a Marvel story to be held, to be grounded and on soil and be self contained, as it opposed as opposed to being. I think people are kind of tired of the multiverse, time travel, everything else. Uh, to me, the problem with the multiverse and nine million characters of this, or nine million versions of the same character, yeah, you've got this really great unique character, and now I'm going to make him not unique by creating 800 other versions of him in the multiverse. A little bit of that goes a long way, and I'm ready for it to be. Here's a character, tell a personal story. Have, how familiar are you or how well do you remember the Daredevil series and the Hawkeye series? Because I remember the Daredevil Netflix series pretty well, but I don't remember the, I didn't remember the Hawkeye series very much. So this, I didn't realize it, this is a Marvel Spotlight uh, a series. So I thought that Marvel Spotlight meant you didn't really have to know a lot going into this show. But I found myself a little confused because I didn't remember where we left off with Kingpin in the Hawkeye series. I didn't even remember that. She, I guess, I guess Maya shot him in the face at the end of the Hawkeye series. Did any of that? Uh, she, did, was, she was definitely a bad girl in the Hawkeye series, but uh, yeah, uh, we don't want to ruin things for people, but uh, Kingpin is essentially her father figure. And then she finds out Kingpin has uh, killed her actual father or had him killed. And of course, uh, you know, tries to get a little revenge there. And uh, essentially, uh, sort of kills him. He, I mean, he doesn't entirely die, but he 
close to it. Yeah. So when we're, we're we see, so like, I, I guess I just have questions. Like, is okay. did she find out that he killed her father in Echo, or is that a flashback to Hawkeye? You know what? I can't recall, but I that may just have been a reveal in Echo. Okay, but she did kill him, or, or try to try to kill him, shoot him in the face in, yeah, in, right. in Hawkeye. Yeah, that was in Hawkeye. But then yeah. the the reveal. Um. Oh my gosh, we're going back too far. I don't remember that. Now that's what I'm saying, and, and my, yeah. the, the, my the whole appeal of the show, or not, maybe not the whole appeal of the show, but a big part of it was this is a not connected storyline. This is just you can watch Echo just for Echo, and I was like, well, how come I need to watch Hawkeye to remember it? <laughs> <laughs> so I find the pacing was a little weird. Uh, Kingpin's back. Uh, I appreciated Wilson Fisk. I, I love that they're bringing back the 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 cast of the Daredevil series because I think the Daredevil series is one of the best marvel products they put out um what did you think of uh echo's fight with daredevil in episode one to me that was uh a really great episode i mean a lot of action uh with uh echo and uh daredevil and you have kingpin show up i mean to me i, I don't know how anybody could uh could not like that because it uh if you watch these for action that was a lot of it I enjoyed the I, I there were some people that were kind of uh, uh, talking negatively about the the Daredevil fight. So I was kind of bracing myself for like, oh no, they're gonna massacre my boy kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, but actually, I appreciated it a lot. So I didn't I didn't mind it. I, I like I think they've redone Daredevil's uh, uh, suit again. He had the red the black suit originally in, in in his show. Then he had the red suit in his show. And then in She-Hulk, they gave him this like yellow, like ketchup and mustard suit. And uh, now he's back to more of like a sleek, uh, dark maroon design. And I appreciated that. Um, and and the, now, now they're at the, the time we're recording this, they're, sh they're shooting the next Daredevil show, mm -hmm. Daredevil Born Again. So if anything, Echo just got me really excited for that. I'd be curious if, if they do more Marvel Spotlight uh, series with other characters who are, who are, you know, certainly not maybe worthy of a major motion picture that cost a jillion dollars but here's a self-contained little story we can throw out at you and who those characters might be do you think that so usually they release uh these series these disney plus series one week at a time and usually they have like eight episodes or so they released echo all at once and it yeah. was only five episodes yeah and talking a little bit about the the confusing you know i was a little bit confused by the pacing because it feels like we're I, the, the pacing just felt a little disjointed it almost feels like there could have been more like maybe they shot thinking they were doing eight episodes and they edited it down to five episodes that coupled with the dropping it all at once do you think that that was a a, a strategic choice on marvel do you think it would have been better suited to to release weekly or do you think dropping it all at once was the right move that's interesting i don't know I mean, I think it was it was watched. It drew, a, it got a lot of viewers initially. But yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Do you gain more viewers if you let it build over five weeks instead of dropping them all at once? My my fear is that they weren't quite confident in the product, so they were like, "Let's just release it all at once, cut it down to five episodes. We'll get it out of the way, and then we'll move on." Um, I, I I I don't know, but these are all things that we wonder with Marvel, because of course there's been a lot of tumultuous, I guess, news stories that have come out about Marvel Studios behind the scenes, because they're of course in a kind of a state of transition, I guess, between you know the Avengers Endgame kind of saga and the new saga, and they're still kind of figuring out what to do. I don't know. These are all questions I have. We got um, Fantastic Four on the way. Fantastic Four. I'm very excited for. I'm very excited for Deadpool three. That's the. I think that's the only theatrical marvel studios movie that's coming out this year is deadpool 3 um because the 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 spider-man movies are like sony sony marvel so this is like i'm excited for deadpool 3 i guess is my point yep um is there anything else we talked a little bit about the ca the cast of reservation dogs showing up for this and also i appreciate uh i'm gonna get the name wrong tantu cardinal cardinal i think it's pronounced you know what? I don't want to try to pronounce it. I work in print, so I'm just going to say I can spell it correctly. Yeah, from from Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, Molly's yes. mom and Killers of the Flower Moon shows up yeah. in this. I enjoyed her role. Do you, is there anything else you want to say? Just any standouts from the Reservation Dogs cast? We got Deverly Jacobs in here, as well as you know some uh, some returning uh, actors from Killers of the Flower Moon. Were there any standout performances? 
And, and you had uh, Chesky Spencer from Telequah was the uncle in uh, Echo. Yeah. And uh, I would have loved to talk to Chesky Spencer about his Oklahoma roots, but I uh, tried, but was unsuccessful. <laughs> but uh, maybe someday we'll find out about uh, Chesky's career. Uh, but you were asking about uh, uh, reservation dogs? Or just uh, just the, the Native American cast members that we in Oklahoma have seen a lot over the past year, kind of them bringing them on for this Echo show. And then I just didn't know if there was any standout performances from those cast of characters. Man, I I just missed Reservation Dogs. And I uh, would love to see what's next. I mean, I've seen some in different reports, Sterling Harjo saying he might do this or this or this next. He, he said he would love to do a uh, Deer Lady uh, series, which I would I'd watch the Deer Lady series. That'd be awesome. That'd be a very different tone from Reservation Dogs because that Deer Lady episode, uh, the back, I guess if you want to call it uh, the backdoor pilot for the Deer Lady, yeah. was uh, was a very dark dark episode, uh, kind of different from the the comedic tone of Reservation Dogs. It would be a really interesting pivot for him, I think, if he did a whole series with her. Yeah, but Reservation Dogs was unlike any other series too, in that you know initially it was called a comedy. And, of course, there's a lot of comedy in the series, but other episodes were just straight out, uh, you know, ripped your heart out kind of yeah. stories, you know, where uh, Elora Danan's, uh, you know, grandmother died. But that was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bear and uh, the other kid's father who committed uh, the kid who committed suicide, his father on the rooftop, you know, yeah. and then they have that moment. And, and the boarding school episode, as you mentioned with Dear Lady, that was yeah. just... You know, that was not comedy at all. That was, they had a story to tell and they told it. Reservate, we're, uh, the more we talk about Echo, the more I'm like, I just need to do a Reservation Dogs rewatch, I think. <laughs> um, let's see. There's a lot of, there's a couple other things. I guess two big things about this series was that uh, Echo is a deaf character who has a handicap. She is missing part of her leg and she is, is deaf. That plays a big role in the series because there's a lot of, uh, 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 American Sign Language, uh, but I, but she cannot read lips. Is that I I, I was like you, you're however many years old and you can't read lips at this point. Even Kingpin need an interpreter. How do you think they navigated that that aspect of the storyline? You know, I, I was thinking as I watched the last two episodes, how much can you imagine the amount of training the actors had to go through to learn sign language for this? Because they were giving sign language and speaking to her at the same time. And mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine how many hours you put in to get that correct and do it on screen. Yeah. It, it just in terms of the pacing again, it did, it may, I feel like it's also a very hard thing to act. I don't want to say, I mean, again, I'm, I don't want to sound ableist or anything because I will never understand the experience of, a, of being a deaf woman, but uh, the, in terms of a performance, there's some very pivotal scenes whenever they're having a heart to heart kind of conversation. And you can really emote with your voice whenever you're not having to pause as much as they were it, you, whenever because they're, they're doing ASL while they're talking. So I guess, and again, this is me coming from my limited perspective. It just did seem like the performances were a little bit um, stunted, like they couldn't quite get into it as much because they had to deliver their dialogue in such a way i don't know it was just a weird thing and then also i am a i am a millennial i look at my phone sometimes and sometimes i look away i get distracted i check my email and man if you're not looking at the screen the entire time you could miss very important <laughs> lines of dialogue because it's not spoken mm. yeah very difficult for me yeah it had to be a challenge for sure because um, i mean how many series have uh, you know people who are hearing impaired as, for, as a lead? You know, but for those people who are hearing impaired, or for in the audience, again, I can only imagine the level of uh, of of joy they must have to be like that's this is something that was made for me. So again, I, I'm coming from a very limited perspective where I'm just kind of like, well, Sam didn't appreciate this or the so it's hard for me to put myself in the place of 
a deaf person who is watching the show and feels seen, that's something very special. I try not to take away from it, but again, these are questions that I ask. Another big thing is the fact that it's a TVMA series. This is Marvel's first uh, kind of, I don't want, I don't know, R, is, well, because R is for theatrical, TV, yeah. TVMA is what they called it. Viewer discretion is advised. Did you, do you think that they utilized that well? Do you think it was necessary, first of all? And do you think it lived up to its, its promise of being a more gory Marvel show? I don't even think it was intentional. I just think they were telling a story and it, I asked, in fact, I, I asked uh, one of the producers about this and I think they just told a story and that got, that label got attached. They weren't shooting for that or trying to uh, take advantage of that. That's just the label they got. And, you know, looking back, you know, what might have gotten them that label? I mean, Kingpin, Kingpin beat the crap out of a uh, hot dog or ice cream vendor, you know? Yeah. And aside from that, it wasn't that bloody. Yeah. I, that's my major i i don't again now that makes sense if it's if this just happens to be the rating that they got but it did feel a little bit like in the pro, in the marketing for the echo show they're like this ain't your daddy's marvel series and i'm like and i watch it and it felt tonally very similar to like a hawkeye or or any other disney plus series so I, there are certain times where i'm like do we really need that viewer discretion is advised but again if it's just the rating they got that makes sense. But but it, I, I almost felt like they were like marketing it as like, oh, you better get ready for this adult series. And I was like, I don't know. It's not great. We're not watching Game of Thrones here. <laughs> and then I guess the last couple things that I wanted to talk about was the the finale uh, and the revelations that had the way that she takes on Kingpin at the powwow and then the kind of her with her powers kind of coming together. Uh, you mentioned that the last two episodes were a little bit uh lesser you like the first few episodes more than the last two episodes how do you feel about how the maya and kingpin situation was wrapped up and then just how the series was wrapped up as a whole yeah, we don't want to spoil it all together but i think as, as viewers we were expecting a physical conclusion and while it was some of that it was more so a mental conclusion am i nailing that okay I think so. I, you, you could be. I don't quite understand what happened. She, she again, I, I, I don't know how to dance around it here, but she, like, she channeled her ancestors, something like that, and then she defeated Kingpin through the power of her ancestors, something like that? Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I don't want to spoil it, but, <laughs> uh, but basically, instead of beating the crap out of him, which I think, you know, would have happened in the comics, she, uh, got into his head somehow oh and she did i remember now and then she did the thing where she made him like mentally regress back to his most vulnerable vulnerable point and yes. uh that's it okay uh-huh okay i didn't I, I i maybe would have liked a little bit more of a physical threat <laughs> yeah there there's something in all of us we'd like to see the bad guy get his due so if the kingpin got the crap kicked out of him you know that wouldn't have been so so bad uh, but the king, the Kingpin's a great villain. He was such a great villain that uh, started out as a Spider-Man villain in the comics, and Daredevil just completely stole him and said, "No, you'll be my villain instead." I want to see Vincent D'Onofrio as the villain in a Spider-Man in a Tom Holland Spider-Man movie so badly. I love that because growing up watching the '90s Spider-Man animated series, yeah, Kingpin mm -hmm. was the the guy. He was like the overarching uh antagonist so i think it, i think it is weird how deadpool kind of stole him. that being said though we did get some key setups for daredevil born again the very end of this series uh, yeah. it sounds like we're this isn't the last that we'll see of, of uh, kingpin at least so are you excited for what's to come yeah like like i said kingpin's a great character i mean he's uh he's not so much super powered he's just a um a mob boss who always is uh basically untouchable it seems like uh and you'll get some electra in the deadpool movie i guess so i don't know uh jennifer garner gets who has a farm in locust grove gets a do-over as electra she has a farm in, in locust grove yes yeah, she has once upon a farm it's, and it's it's a baby food natural baby food company they grow all the uh uh actual you know fruit or vegetables there at the farm or at other farms and uh, yeah, her, her mother is a 1957 graduate of Locust Grove High School. Uh, and so it's the old family farm. And now she, Jennifer Garner is using it for Once Upon a Farms. 
Oh, that's great. So Jennifer Garner may have actually spent more time in Oklahoma than the Echo team did. That's possible. Yeah. That's a little joke about how they didn't film here. I just wish they would have filmed here. Maybe that's why I'm so salty. Why didn't they film in Oklahoma? Come on. If Reservation Dogs can do it, if Killers of the Flower Moon can do it, shoot in Oklahoma. <laughs> I would have loved it. Jimmy Trammell, thank you so much. What If you wanted to give like a kind of one last sentence review of your whole experience with Echo, final thoughts from you, what say you about the series Echo? I, I would just recommend it as a change of pace because I was tired of the time travel multiverse uh, span across several galaxies uh, giant epic. I was ready for, uh, here's a, here's a story all by itself. Uh, and, uh, I don't know, you, you may be, uh, less enthusiastic about it, but I would, I'd give it a B. I, I don't know what I would give it on a letter grade. I watched it all, all the way through once. I don't know that I'll ever watch it again. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Marvel products like the Daredevil, the Daredevil series on Netflix. I'll rewatch that from time to time just because that holds up. Echo, unfortunately, I, I love the promise of a lot of it. I love exploring the Choctaw Nation, going smaller, bringing back Daredevil, Kingpin, doing. I like the idea of a of a hitman kind of character that's kind of redeeming, repenting a little bit her, for her ways, getting back in touch with her roots. Unfortunately, in the way that they that it came together. A lot of some of the deci the decision not to shoot here, for instance, and then also the the way that it came through in the in in the final I guess the final the final edit. I I was a little bit disappointed. I did maybe it's because I did have higher hopes because we had just come off a of reservation. Dogs kills the flower moon. Maybe I expected more. I don't know. I would recommend it to Oklahomans, and I'm proud of everybody that I know that got to be a part of it. And I think it was an amazing opportunity. I just would have liked to have seen a little bit more. You know, it almost felt a little bit like. Disney wanted the props for doing the indigenous stuff, but didn't quite want to put in the work. And I guess that's where I'm a little bit disappointed. I'm I'm more mad Tulsa King didn't film in Tulsa than I am uh, Echo didn't film in Oklahoma. Don't get me started on Tulsa King. I am not watching series two, season two of that that show because they're not even going to shoot in, in Oklahoma at all anymore. I, don't get me started on Tulsa King. Do not recommend Tulsa King either. I did. I, it was hard to finish that show. At least I finished Echo. I had to force myself to finish Tulsa King. We're not reviewing Tulsa King, though. We're talking about Jimmy Trammell. He is the pop culture writer for the Tulsa World. People can find your work at TulsaWorld.com. Thank you so much for joining the show, show, Jimmy, and I hope to see you again soon. Yep. Thank you. Behave. All right, that's our show. I'd like to send a special thank you to Jimmy Trammell for joining us this week. Next week, we'll be talking about the new Marvel Sony feature, Madam Web, as well as the Matthew Vaughn-directed Argyle, starring Henry Cavill. I'm Sam Carrico. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Samuel D. Carrico. You can find the Film Fan Club show on Facebook and TikTok at the Film Fan Club. If you like us, make sure you like this on YouTube or give us a review on your podcast app of choice. It would really mean a lot to us. I'm Sam Carrico. I'll see you next week.